Hello, everyone, and the Woo Stream, where we're bringing Willamette to you. Thank you for joining this evening's Parent and Family Forum. My name is Eric Lasan, and I'm from Parent Engagement. Before we begin, I'll share a few logistical items. This session will operate much like a webinar, and your microphone will not be active. We've taken the questions submitted by you in advance and shared them with our presenter so he can include those answers in his remarks. We have Sayer Cohen, Assistant Director of Arts, Alumni, and Community Engagement, matching managing production this evening. Throughout this evening's presentation, we will monitor the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen, so please submit your questions as you have them. You can also use the Q&A function if you're having technical difficulties, and Sayer or I will do our best to help. This evening's session will focus on institutional equity, diversity, and inclusion at Willamette University. And now I'll introduce our presenter for this evening, Emilio Solano. In June of 2022, Dr. Emilio Solano became the Assistant Provost of Institutional Equity and Community Engagement at Willamette University. In, his, in this role, he assists in the development and promotion of diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives throughout the university and its respective colleges and units as well as relationship building and strategic partnerships in the Salem, Kaiser, and Portland communities. Emilio graduated from Willamette in 2009 with a bachelor's degree in history and American ethnic studies. He then participated in Teach for America, where he also earned a master's degree in urban education, policy, and administration from Loyola Marymount University, and completed coursework through the National Academy of Advanced Teacher Education in 2021. He graduated with a Doctor of Education in Educational Leadership from Lewis and Clark College in 2021. Emilio's experience also includes teaching middle school history and language arts and work as assistant principal at Camino, Camino Nuevo Charter Academy. He has served as Dean of Students at the ICEF Inglewood Middle Charter Academy and as core member advisor and school director during Teach for America's Summer Institute. Prior to joining Provost's office here at Willamette. Dr. Solano was the executive director of Willamette Academy, our university's out of school college access program. And that was from 2016 to 2022. So, welcome, Emilio. And I'm going to hand it off to you now. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Um, if you're able to share the screen for the PowerPoint presentation, it'll be wonderful. So as Eric's getting that all set up, um, thanks for the intro. Uh, I was going to cover a little bit of kind of how I came to this work anyways. So that's super helpful. Um, you know, I, I, I guess for me, uh, you know, my professional experience or my start in education really comes from the K-12 sector. So I have somewhat of a non-traditional route entering kind of higher education administration and certainly this role. Um, but I like to say that that I've been doing diversity, equity, inclusion really work um, or that type of work really since I was in college, um, interning for Willamette Academy or volunteering for Willamette Academy or access program um, before those terms were kind of the buzzwords that they are uh, today. So really excited to be with you here today um, and chat with you a little bit about kind of what diversity, equity, inclusion means for a little bit, but, but really what that means uh, in the work that I do at Willamette University. Um, I, I am aware of the hot button issue that DEI as a buzzword has become um, lately and, and, and politicized, certainly. Um, but what that means on the ground uh, is not always what we hear about in the news. So I'm, I'm excited to kind of talk about what this work means uh, for, for Willamette uh, and our community members. Uh, next slide's great, Eric. There we go. So uh, one of the big tasks that I undertook last year, and I've been in this role um, just since last year was kind of defining diversity, equity, inclusion. We did this with the DEI committee, the university-wide DEI committee that I'll discuss a little bit later, but I thought it'd be important to just start here. Um, if you're more interested in these terms, uh, I'm not gonna read them all to you. Uh, we do have this on our website um, under the institutional equity website. Um, this is a shared language the university DEI committee adopted um, with representation from all the schools um, and other uh, representatives from departments uh, at our university. And so, you know, thinking about how we define diversity, um, obviously there are many, many different identity markers that we might, might work with, but the DEI committee thought it was really important to also talk about when we think through diversity, what opportunities that provides our community. Um, and a lot of that comes with engaging with differing perspectives, beliefs, values, and lived experiences. 
Um, so thinking about uh, what impact can we have when we engage with folks that are coming from many different areas, um, whether that's lived experience, geographical location, or identity markers. Um, when we think about equity, and I'm going to dig into this term just a little bit, I know that there were some questions around this, but really that comes down to honoring what our community members need and, and treating them and their needs with respect. So, so thinking about what challenges or barriers or access pieces they might be coming to us with and how we can support community members to make sure that they are able to access our space um, equally. And then uh, inclusion, uh, the way I like to term this is it's bringing people into connection. It's about creating a sense of belonging. It's simply about making sure that community members are feeling included in the different aspects of what um, our, our community expects to do or, or what our educational opportunities are. Um, so those are kind of the definitions we're working with. Uh, there are more words associated with this on the website if you wanna check those out, but I, I thought it'd be good to ground us in kind of how we see DEI are these terms, diversity, equity, inclusion at Willamette University. Uh, next slide. So why diversity, equity, inclusion in the first place? So thinking about what that means for uh, Willamette, this again is in the shared definition language on the website, but we recognize that we all enter Willamette at different places and that we leave not the same, that, that a part of this experience, whether that's as a student um, or as an employee is educational and that we are continuing to grow and learn each day and interact with folks that are unlike ourselves. Um, and that these three terms together support the development of the kind of community where all members can learn and flourish. That is at the core of our mission as an educational institution. So you may have seen this uh, picture um, before. And I, I think it's helpful as we start to think about kind of equality versus equity, um, equality of opportunity, equity of opportunity. And I guess as I see these definitions or as we see these definitions in the work that I do at Willamette is that each individual for equality, each individual or group of people is given the same resources or opportunities, regardless of potential outcome that we make some assumptions of an equal playing field, um, an equal opportunity um, without really taking into consideration uh, where a person comes from or the circumstances that may exist around their childhood, their upbringing or their current uh, lifestyle. Uh, when we think of equity, it's it's really viewing it as each individual or group that, that is different circumstances that we must investigate and then the resources and opportunities that are needed to reach an equal outcome. And I'm going to talk about kind of what we mean by equal outcome in just a little bit here. But I think it's an important distinction to, to make that, yes, we want equality. Absolutely. But equality makes a lot of assumptions that we're all entering at the same exact space with the same challenges, um, with the same circumstances. And that's just not the case. We deal with so many different types of students as they enter our institution um, and employees as well. And, and, and folks, as we think about hiring and things like that. So um, equity takes into consideration um, what our students or our community members need in order to be successful here. So there are a million examples of why to, what it means and what it doesn't mean, but I want to kind of provide a couple or a few examples of what this work means and the, the way we see it. So again, as I mentioned, you know, my uh, professional experience that led me here was was teaching eighth grade um, and being an eighth grade administrator, a middle school and K twelve administrator, and so. You know, a lot of these things, when we think about diversity, equity, inclusion, what do these words mean? We've been doing it for years. It just necess doesn't necessarily been called that in years past. And so now that we have these terms, we, we maybe think that it's separate work, but the work continues as just it has for, for years and years. And so one of those big things at, at Willamette, as an example, is we don't have application fees. Um, when somebody wants to uh, apply to our university, um, they can do that for free. Now, when I was applying to school back in 2004 and ended up attending Willamette, it cost me money to apply. And that that as a barrier um, has since been eliminated. So that no application fee is something that encourages diversity, that encourages equitable practices, and then ultimately access for who can access um, our institution. Financial aid is a similar piece, right? Um, when we think about diversity, equity, and access, financial aid packages are going to be dependent on how much 
a student's family makes and then how they can afford or if they can afford the university, right? If we looked at financial aid as an equal opportunity, there would be a lot of people that could not access our institution because they could not afford it. Um, accommodations for students with disability. Uh, so thinking about what kind of disabilities are students entering, whether those are physical or learning disabilities, and what kind of access points do we need to create or accommodations in the classroom do we need to be able to create so that those students are able to access the content, the classroom, the work that's being required of them so that they can, they can do it as, just as if they're able-bodied peers. Um, if we think about uh, disaggregating data, um, uh, specifically, I'm thinking about retention and graduation rates because it's something that we have been highly and hyper focused this last year and a half. Um, we're looking at things like uh, are there rate are there gaps in terms of race when it comes to retention and graduation rates? Are there gaps in terms of gender when it comes to our retention and graduation rates? Are there rates in terms of class? Um, when we look at our retention and graduation rates, those are things that we're thinking about because we're seeing unequal or unequal outcomes in our retention and graduation rates. And then we need to better understand, are there equity issues here? Are there policy issues here? Are there academic support issues here that we can be offering so that we get those subsets and those subgroups of students when we disaggregate that data to have an equal outcome when it comes to their peers? Um, cultural student clubs and programmings, right? The, 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 these are things that have been happening for years, but those clubs exist for diversity, for inclusion and to encourage belonging. Um, when we think about uh, admissions, again, expanding the pool of students. So what recruitment out, uh, outreach efforts or do we have out there? Where are we recruiting? What schools are we recruiting in? When we think about job applicants, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about job descriptions a little bit later, but um, where are we posting those jobs? Are we, are we casting a wide net that encourages a diverse, um, applicant pool so that we can encourage that same diversity with who's a part of our community members. And then lastly, something new that we've actually added this year, uh, employee, employee resource groups. So thinking about uh, what particular identity markers or affinities or interests um, might encourage diversity, inclusion, and belonging and encourage retention, rate, uh, retention rates or even recruitment rates when it comes to our employees. So uh, an example of this is we have a we we have a um, a POC or people of color employees of color resource group this year. We have an LGBTQ plus um, employee resource group. But some of the other examples that we've we've encouraged are things like um, what if you had uh, an aging parent that's ill. Um, we used to have an employee resource group this years ago that that encouraged bringing employees together to talk about this important steps and this important support efforts that are offering maybe parents. Another one might be uh, um, early professionals um, and thinking about uh, folks that are entering higher education or entering kind of their first pro professional opportunity. Are there employee resource groups that offer support systems for them as they navigate this world as early um, as recent graduates and early career professionals? Um, and then what doesn't it mean? And I think this is another important distinction to make as we start to think about um, some of the critique of DEI or some of the, the narratives that are being spun out there right now. It does not mean lowering our expectations. Our admission sta standards for, for admission are our admission standards. Um, not basing decisions off of merit necessarily, right? So um, it doesn't mean that we are lowering our expectations or that merit is out of the equation when we're thinking of who are we admitting or who are we hiring? Um, it is not favoring one group over another. Like I said, if we are recognizing that there is a, an outcome that is not equal across population or subgroups as we disaggregate data, we are gonna be paying special attention to that subgroup so that we can make sure that an equal outcome uh, can happen at some point with the right support systems. It's not solely focused on race and gender. And I'll talk a little bit more about this in a little bit. Uh, it's not a fad, um, whether it's been called diversity, equity, and inclusion or not. Uh, the practices that I named in the slide before have been going on for years and years and years. And then also, it, it can feel lonely in my role, but DEI is not one person's job or the sole responsibility um, 
of one office. Uh, we have a lot of really incredible people here on this campus doing really great work. Um, I'm located in the provost office on the academic affairs side. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, but we have great work in student affairs that are really focused on the student experience of campus. Um, we have people doing great work in, in human resources to ensure that our employees are, are accessing our campus, that they are uh, feeling a sense of belonging on our campus. Um, and so there's a lot of people that are tasked with this responsibility, even if uh, diversity, equity, or inclusion may not be in their title or necessarily in the job description itself. So I want to just take a little time to kind of uh, situate what I do um, in the really um, broad sense of the university because it's a, it's a big institution. So this assistant provost role is, is situated in the provost office, with, which is within academic affairs, which, which puts some parameters around its locus of control. Number one, this is inaugural, an inaugural role. Um, say that five times fast. Um, but I, I think for this, it's important to understand that we're really still feeling out what this role does. And, and sometimes there's blurred lines and sometimes there's really, really narrow lines of which I need to follow. So my role is best summarized as focusing on strategic planning uh, and systems building. One of our big strategic plan goals of our recent strategic plan that was released uh, a, a couple of years ago is to create structures that institutionalize DEI-related activities, practices, and conversations. And this is also coming at a time when Willamette, Willamette now has five schools. We just added the School of Computing and Information Sciences, and um, it's a really exciting time to be at Willamette, but that also means that there's a lot of communication and coordination across schools that is more necessary than ever. Um, supporting individual school initiatives is also important. I'll talk a little bit about that. Even though there's a university DEI committee, each school also has their own school level committee that's doing much of this work too. And then thinking about our programs and curriculum that are becoming more integrated across colleges. So these are all things we're thinking of within the role that I'm currently situated in. So spending some time thinking about kind of what uh, my primary responsibilities are here. Number one, it's to chair the university DEI committee, which I know Eric mentioned in, in my introduction. Um, there's a map here of kind of how that committee works. Um, but, you know, at the at the, the core of it is that uh, it's communication and coordination. We have a uh, student representative from every school. We have a faculty representative from every school. And then we have university representatives, as you can see on the right hand side there, um, representing various departments of, of, of the university as a whole. And what that has allowed us to do is to talk about the different initiatives, the different programs that are happening across the institution, as well as making sure that we aren't recreating something that's already been created. If the law school is doing something that College of Arts and Sciences is really interested in, they can talk about that during the committee and then they can talk offline and start thinking about ways that they might partner or learn from each other. Um, it's an opportunity for us to assist and provide feedback, uh, feedback very often specific to my role. I work with a really great staff in the provost office, but again, from a title standpoint, even though many good people are doing this work, I'm the one tasked with a lot of this work. So I see the DEI committee really as my team, um, and they're able to provide feedback as I start to get ideas or want to plan new initiatives. Um, we identify and address emerging issues as well. If there's uh, something that should be brought up to the committee, maybe a gap or an area of concern, uh, there is always space reserved during our committee meetings to do that. And then it's largely advisory. Uh, we don't necessarily create policy in this committee, but we can certainly advise on potential policies that are being created or um, start brainstorming new policies that may need to be considered uh, in the name of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then for our priority areas, as I mentioned earlier, one of our big, big tasks last year was to create a shared language for diversity, equity, inclusion. What do we mean when we say this at Willamette University? Um, so we were able to accomplish that last year. Another big thing that we did last year was uh, implement a campus climate survey, uh, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, we were also able to, to give feedback and create an annual report for my office. If you are interested, again, in kind of um, the many things that, uh, that, that I was able or we were able to accomplish out of this office, uh, that is also located on the website under the Institutional Equity website. 
And then um, one of our big tasks this year is to start thinking about staff and faculty recruitment retention. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as well uh, later on in the presentation. So we conducted a campus climate survey last year. Um, it was our, or sorry, not last year, but in the, yeah, 2023, uh, February 5th through March 5th. It was our first campus climate survey since 2019. And I believe the 2019 survey was the first time that we had ever conducted a survey. And the survey really asked students, faculty, and staff, and administrators about three big areas. First, their perceptions of Willamette's climate. And when I say climate, I, I, uh, I'm talking about a sense in which people feel included or a sense of belonging, um, perceptions of how Willamette supports diversity and equity, and then experiences with discrimination and harassment at Willamette. Uh, as I mentioned, we implemented this February 5th to March 5th. Um, our participation rate out of the uh, around 2,200 students and 900 faculty, staff, and administrators that were invited to complete the survey, um, we had a participation rate at about 24%. Um, now, the good news is that is a pretty industry standard uh, to have a 24% uh, response rate is pretty on par with our, our, our peer institutions. Uh, the, the disappointing part is that when we did this in 2019, we had a nearly 50% participation rate for that survey. Um, so it doesn't make us think any less of the survey. Um, I think there's a few different ways that you can look at this. N number one, it's certainly not the participation that we wanted, but number two, there's still really useful data in this survey that we can look to um, and start thinking about how we can create a, a, a university with a, with a stronger climate for diversity and equity. Um, and then I think an important caveat, should you uh, take a look at the survey report when it's released, hopefully, this month, it has been a process, but we are near the finish line and I'm waiting for somebody to make it look fancy for us. Um, but among the near, so I, I think it's important to look at the results as among the nearly 25% of our community who responded to their survey, blank indicated that. So we're thinking about things like discrimination or harassment or things like, uh, I feel like I belong to the university or that there's a sense of belonging within this climate. Um, to think through not that all students or all community members feel this way, but that 25% of our community who responded to the survey feel this way. And when we start to think through the survey in this way, uh, those results can become really useful to conversations and support systems. So when thinking about our campus climate survey response, uh, this has been a, this is going to be a key thing that the, the DEI committee is focused on this year. Um, and so we're going to be thinking through forums, workshops, or focus groups that will be held to, to further dig into climate trends that we have identified uh, through uh, the survey report. So there's a couple areas that we're already thinking of here. Uh, first is we want to create an additional space to learn more from our Black and Latinx students who or small sample sizes within the overall response rate. Um, another piece that, that is interesting is we wanna think and, and, and create space to, for our multiracial students to talk through their experiences on campus, particularly in regards to discrimination and harassment, because we saw higher reports of discrimination and harassment from our multiracial students uh, than their, their monoracial peers. Uh, we also want to create space for um, talking about and leaning into conversations around political and religious views on campus and those differing views. Uh, this is something that we want to certainly leverage the conversation project about, which is something that two of our faculty members have, have really had great success with, um, which is really focused on creating space to have conversations when you might differ in viewpoints um, from that person you're having a conversation with. And it was actually recently uh, featured on OPB uh, talking about the great success that that, pro that project has had. Um, also talking about different perceptions and different environments on campus in relationship to that sense of belonging uh, that I was talking about. We see in the data that when our community members say uh, are, are asked, do they feel like uh, they belong? Uh, to the community, there's a much more positive response to that question than when they think about how they feel others belong to the community. Um, and so digging into why that might be is going to be something that we're going to create space to have a conversation about as well. And then lastly, in the qualitative piece um, of that feedback in this survey, uh, 
there's a strong push for, for thinking about recruitment and retention of staff and faculty. I will admit that I think that's a pretty natural response. I, I think we could have a really high retention rate for staff and faculty, and it would, it would likely still show up um, in these climate surveys that we conduct. And when we dig deeper into that, that qualitative data, what, what our staff and faculty are actually asking for are greater opportunities for connection with each other, greater opportunities for professional development and investment in their development um, that we saw previously to the pandemic um, to try to get back to that kind of culture that we had on this campus from a staff and faculty standpoint uh, prior to the pandemic hitting. And I think we can probably all understand why it's been slow to get back to that kind of sense of normal. Um, staff and faculty retention recruitment, I want to just dig into this a little bit more. Uh, number one, some things that we do to encourage uh, uh, anti-bias um, and, and, and diverse perspectives during hiring processes. So we have uh, search advocates uh, that serve on hiring search committees. That's for staff and faculty. And this is a member of the search committee that's serving to advise members on, on DEI issues related to hiring practice. And often this is thinking about what bias might exist or in, un, uh, implicit bias might exist during the hiring process. Um, and that could also be within job descriptions. I'm going to bring an example to light in the next slide I have here. And as I mentioned, uh, this being a priority area for the University DEI Committee throughout this year, we really want to regain those pre-pandemic levels of interaction, uh, creating more opportunities for community connection and professional development, and then thus hopefully encouraging a larger sense of belonging for staff and faculty that it both encourages uh, their retention, but encourages just their overall, overall happiness, happiness and sense of belonging to, to our campus communities. And I wanna just bring kind of an example of inclusive framing, right? Um, this is a, a recent uh, job position description that we have for an administrative program coordinator position. And I was brought into an email thread to start thinking through how we might want to start this job description uh, text. And the original job description really led with a bachelor's degree in minimum uh, and a minimum of three years of general office experience. But then at the very bottom says, in lieu of a bachelor's degree, five years or more of the required experience will be considered. The challenge there is that there's a lot of research that says when an applicant sees that minimum requirement of a bachelor's degree or any kind of minimum requirement, they often sometimes just stop reading at that point. They will self-select out of a job. And so when we started digging into some of this text and making sure that we're thinking through how to write this job description more inclusively, um, we wanted to do the reverse, where we start with truly the minimum uh, experience required. So we started with at least five years of general office experience and then we, at the very bottom, said associates or bachelor's degree will be considered in lieu of specific job experience. And so we're thinking about how we're writing these job descriptions. A search advocate might sit on a hiring committee and start thinking through how can we write a job description that's going to encourage as many people to apply to that job as possible, regardless of background or regardless of potential experience, so that they don't self-select out and then thus create a less diverse pool of applicants. This is a really simple way within the language that we use um, to think through how we can expand that pool of applicants and then hopefully get a really diverse pool to consider for that job. Again, the expectations uh, has not been lowered of this job position, but the framing has hopefully encouraged a more wide, uh, wide, wide group or that, that casting that wide net of folks to apply. So, you know, I could have talked a little bit about like, what does diversity, equity, and inclusion mean? Um, but I really wanted to, or, or get into the words and the definitions a little bit more, but I really wanted to create some examples of what that work looks like within the role that I have at the university. And, and I'm hopeful that it's helpful for you all to think through what this work, this, this work looks like in actual practice on the ground. Um, so I hope that this is helpful. I believe the next slide is opening this up to questions and I would just love to have a dialogue with all of you. Oh, I've got one more slide. As an example, again, the good work is happening all over campus. So I mentioned student affairs, like this is just, these are just five folks that are deeply engaged in this work and thinking about how as many students, as many community members can feel engaged 
can feel included, can feel like they belong to the different systems, the different programs, the different um, things that we offer at this institution. Um, and so I'm not, I'm not certainly not alone in this work that I do. I could have made a slide of, of 50 other people that are doing similar work on this campus, uh, that their job responsibilities at least touch something that we know is related to diversity or that is related to equity or that is related to inclusion. And now I think I can open it up to questions for the Q and A. All right. As we, uh, wait to see if some additional questions come in. Emilio, I, I think that the question that's on my mind is, is kind of a jumping off from exactly where you just left off. You've, you've really given us a framework and, and highlighted the ways that your office is doing this work. And then with that last slide, just highlighted some other folks who's kind of some of their primary responsibilities is, is diversity, equity, and inclusion on our campus. And then when we think about the wider community and ways that everybody can participate, you mentioned the survey, um, you mentioned programming, having people attend and have dialogue, the conversation project and participating um, through that vehicle. Are there other ways that, you know, members of, you know, whether it's students, faculty, or even parents that are on with us this evening, other ways that you'd like to see more folks leaning in um, around the, this shared work and ongoing work? Yeah, I mean, when I think of kind of, where diversity, equity, and inclusion begins, I, I think of it as an as an access piece often, right? And, and that's my own bias when I think about DEI because that's where I'm coming from. When I was teaching eighth grade, it was about creating access points to make sure that they were successful in high school. Um, when I was teaching eighth grade or thinking about experiential opportunities, it was, it was really about pushing that piece of, of, of career, but also college. Like what opportunities exist for you and, and how do you get to college? And I think that there are so many barriers just to start <laughs> with even accessing this place. Um, I think we have to be really real sometimes when we think about we as a as a as a higher education institution. Um, by definition, a part of that applicant process, we are excluding. Right? We are we are looking at what our what our standards are, what our expectations are. Do we feel that a student um, can be successful here? and not every student is being accepted to this place, right? And so I think oftentimes when we think about um, about DEI, it's, it's, it's getting rid of uh, um, the expectations, the standards, right? I think that's sometimes a narrative that, that happens here and that's just not the case. Um, I think for us, again, it's, it's about how do we ensure that as many students as possible can access the entry points to this place. And then when they are here, um, what are those wraparound support systems that we can create to not ensure only that they are academically successful here, which is obviously very important, but that they are they are successful when it comes to the social pieces, when it comes to the connecting pieces, when it comes to the campus life pieces. And so I, I, I'm trying to think like how, how parents might be able to get involved in that. Um, I think it's certainly encouragement of their students to um, to seek out support systems, to seek out help. Um, to engage with the different opportunities that exist. Um, there is programming constantly on our campus when it comes to things, again, that sometimes feel very DEI focused, but then again, don't always feel that. Um, we have a lot of months that are uh, um, uh, cultural uh, heritage months uh, that has programming throughout that month where any student can participate. Uh, whether that's an educational opportunity, whether that's a speaker, whether that's a specific celebration that's celebrating a particular uh, event on campus. Um, you know, I, I think it's also about leaning in. Um, and I think one of the things we we see in this kind of more polarized society that we're in right now is that we often put labels on folks when we disagree with them or that when we think they have a, a, an opinion that is wrong. Um, and I think the beauty of the college experience is that our students and even I, uh, we get to we get to do that every day um, in those classrooms or, or in the, those meeting rooms. Um, I have no problem with talking about the fact that I think even me as a DEI professional, um, again, not a space I ever thought I would necessarily be in. I was always the one on the ground doing the work. And now I get to sit in the space of strategic thinking and planning. But uh, I never assume that I know everything. 
or never assume that I don't have other education to other things to learn. Some of those very folks on that slide I just showed you, I was in a meeting uh, just before we went off for break and we were talking about the campus climate survey report. Um, And we were like so close to having this thing done. I I kept saying we're on like the one yard line. Um, And one of those, those, uh, those folks on that, on that, on that slide said, Hey, actually we have to talk about something that I think should be reframed. And I didn't understand why it needed to be reframed. I I didn't, um, it was, I was naive or ignorant or whatever you want to say. So I asked, yeah, let's talk after and um, we'll figure that out. And then one of the other people in that meeting was like, actually, could you have the conversation right here in front of us? Like, would you be okay with that? Because maybe it's something that we could learn too. Um, And so I, I was asking questions and trying to figure out like, why do we need to say things that way? Or why are we framing it this way? Um, because that's not something that I understood was a thing. And so I, what I'm trying to say is that like, I was unafraid to, well, I had a little bit of fear, but <laughs> to have that conversation and to kind of model as well, like, I don't know it all, but I'm going to listen to what, if you think it's a best practice, let me learn why it's a best practice. Let me see what we can do. Um, and I think just anytime we can enter into this space where we don't see diversity, equity, and inclusion um, and automatically have a thought or, or, or a, um, an opinion, uh, that we enter it with an open mind. And I think our students do that every, every day. I really do think that they do a really incredible job of that. And I think when myself as an adult or other people in that room are able to also do that, um, I don't pretend to be an expert in all things. Uh, and so if other people can help me along the way to make sure that we are doing what we need to do to the best of our ability on this campus, uh, that's huge. I don't know if that answers your question, Eric, but that was a really long winded uh, response. Well, I appreciate it on, on, on multi levels. Um, you gave us time to, to receive some additional questions. Uh, I do think you answered the question. My next question actually was a little bit about the way that students maybe more directly could be involved in this work. And, and you highlighted that with that answer as well. Um, so much appreciation to, uh, to all of those, uh, those bullet points. Um, so the next question is, is kind of specific. Um, a, a parent shared that they have a multiracial freshman son at Willamette. And are there any further specifics on the how um, why that cohort experienced more negative interactions on campus. I think maybe this is referring to the climate survey as opposed yeah. to other cohorts as mentioned in the climate survey. Um, and then they, as an aside, they, they wanted to make sure that they shared that his experience so far has been positive. Yeah, you know, it's, boy, you, you've asked the wrong guy uh, that question because my entire dissertation uh, was about uh, biracial um uh, Latino and white biracial teachers um, in the K-12 sector. And so a lot of that was about biracial identity theory um, and thinking about, you know, how are multiracial and biracial students developing that identity um, throughout their time? And then for me, specifically the population I was looking at are, um, how does it impact those teachers and their professional identities? Um, and so, you know, we haven't conducted those focus groups yet. I can speak to like what I think it might be. Um, but I think a lot of our students who are multiracial are, are often um, experiencing uh, kind of a crossroads experience or, or one foot and another foot over different two lines of experience. And so that often provides a heightened sense of um, um I guess identity in many ways, but also things that they're hearing. It, it depends on maybe they're in spaces um, because of that identity that that monoracial peers are not in spaces. So they're hearing things that maybe a monoracial peer might not hear. So there's a lot of things that I might make assumptions about given kind of what the literature says, but um, I don't want to speak out of turn before we get a chance to to, to sit down with, with our multiracial students. We have a new club on campus called the Multiracial Collective. It's been around for about a year, a year and a half now. And um, I've presented with them. We've had conversations about these experiences, but we have not specifically talked about this piece of the survey yet. Um, and I'm interested and excited to engage with them so that, to see what we might be able to learn. Um, again, I think it's important, right? This is a really great example because we might say of the um, you know, 25% uh, participants that completed the survey, 
right? Uh, from our community, right? Of that 25% section, you know, 15% of those respondents identified as multiracial. And of those 15% of respondents identified as multiracial, you know, 40% of them, and this is getting in the weeds now, right? Reported mm -hmm. that they had experienced some kind of harassment or discrimination. And so um, I want to be really careful again, when we talk about experience, it's a question of if 10 of our multiracial students are experiencing discrimination or harassment, is that enough for us to ask some questions to why that might be, right? And, and for me, I think 10 is plenty. And so I think it's important that we do have a conversation with them. I think one is plenty, right? To have a conversation about it, right? And so um, we always have to think about what's within our capacity, um, but to find like how many is enough for us to pay attention to something becomes really, really tricky. And so if we recognize that there's a trend or that there is a percentage, regardless of how low that that number of students actually might be, let's look into it. Right, right. I mean, the climate survey is, it's a tool and it's it provides insight, but it's really a, a beginning point. It's a jumping off point. It's not a, here's how we're doing, you know, put that, put that report out and then put it on the shelf, right? That's actually, that's so well said. Um, we plan on conducting this climate survey every three years, um, but that doesn't mean we're not doing things in between that are going to continually um, identify how students are experiencing this campus and then hopefully making uh, adjustments so that we ensure a positive experience. Right. Right. Awesome. Well, thank you for, for that helping. I, you know, when you said get down in the weeds, I think there's, you know, how else are we going to, yeah, to, to kind of get get further down. There was a there there was in your in your other um, answer about you know how how can people participate? And you were like, I don't you know how can parents participate? Well, what I'm happy about is that there are parents with us tonight here. This is a, a session for them, and they chose to join us and spend time thinking about this and asking questions and 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 hearing what you have to say. And then the recording, you know, will be out there, and I'm, I know that, that other parents will uh, will watch it. So it looks like we've got another two questions. The next one is much of the controversy around DEI seems to be from people who have a conservative worldview. Um, what's involved in encouraging a culture where community members can speak up regardless of their political or religious beliefs without being excluded? I know, you know, you, you touched upon the, the conversation project, and I don't know if that's where you're going to start or if elaborate on that or maybe there are other ways that we that we create space for folks from that background yeah i mean again when i you know say cultural clubs or student clubs on campus right I, there are certainly clubs number one that that do encourage that right that they're creating space on our campus so that students of of like-minded views can gather um of religious views can gather um you know, Willamette is a is a unique place as a liberal arts institution where much of our classes are conducted um, through discussion, through uh, agreement and disagreement. Um, and sometimes the, there's a, a challenge with with kind of butting heads or, or or what do you do when you feel that sense of disagreement? And I think the tough part for our students who live in a very different world than when I grew up, like I have no qualms, like just saying that when I came to Willamette in 2005, like I wasn't really that engaged in political discourse. Um, I wasn't like, I, I understood a lot when it came to kind of my experience. Um, when I, when I, when I thought about kind of my religious identity as somebody that is Catholic or my uh, racial identity as somebody who's biracial and, you know, uh, somebody who's a man in this world, like these things I did understand, but when it came to kind of the political piece, that's not something I, I was talking was really talked about a lot growing up. And when I came to Willamette, it really started to develop here because I was for the first time really engaging in complex things and, and hearing people that I agreed with and didn't agree with and and uh, um, and then figuring out how to how to work that out. Our students now get on Twitter or they're on TikTok or they're yeah. on, I mean, I don't think they actually use Facebook that much anymore. Maybe they're on Facebook, right? <laughs> and they can find their individual silos wherever they want. Um, and so I think that there is um, a very real fear of whether we want to call it cancel culture or just being labeled as something that you're not when you want to speak up and say something. I, I have no issue admitting that because of this unique nature that a small 
campus or a small college like we have is, right? And so um, the Conversation Project is a really great outlet that has sought to kind of start to think through this challenge that we've had at Willamette. Um, but I would imagine that the space, because I know our faculty and I was once a student here um, who taught who, who took classes with some of the very faculty that are still teaching here, even though I'm, I'm feeling very old these days. Um, <laughs> that space encourages that disagreement. It encourages um, differing viewpoints. It encourages learning from each other because that's, as I mentioned, even in the initial definition of diversity, like that's what this is all about. And mm -hmm. so I think the more that our students can give grace um, on all sides, the more our students can can seek to understand um, or um, understand that there is going to be difference and that we can also uh, um, disagree without labeling or mislabeling someone at the same time. And so um, mm -hmm. I think it's something that our faculty are hyper aware and talk about constantly, even if sometimes in the narrative of that we see in higher education today is nope, it's like your it's got to be this way and that's it. I just don't buy that that's actually happening in our classrooms at Willamette at least. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. We we were fortunate enough recently to see a presentation from the faculty and students who are directly involved in in the conversation project, and one of the students was talking about the difference between, um, you know, a conversation that's that's um, you know, rooted in the conversation project versus some of the conversations that happen in class. And that sometimes in class, it can get heated because students really are in that space. The faculty are creating a safe enough space that students can get a little heated. They can get a little, you know, this is my perspective. This is my, and stand up for those values and viewpoints. Um, so to me, that speaks to what the, the, the space, the faculty create for multiple perspectives. And then the conversation project is a little more like, hey, let's make sure everybody feels welcome and is heard and, and seeking that mutual understanding instead of maybe sometimes in class, it's the, it might be cliche at this point, but the agree to disagree, as long as you can kind of support your, you know, your, your perspective and, and let's say argument. Um, well, anyway, and I, well, and I can think of just, again, I, it's easy for me to speak from personal experiences because I attended Willamette, but, and there's so many faculty members that st are still there, but my senior year and my, um, senior thesis class, I remember I was having a very heated discussion over one of the topics. That was actually my theory class, I think. Um, and I was the only student in that classroom of 13 to take a particular side. Um, and I remember the professor stopping me at the end of class. And, and she might have agreed with the other side, but she stopped me at the end of class and said, hey, it was brave of you to take that to take that on. And I'm um, like, thank you, because it, 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 so it helped what we are supposed to do in this classroom anyways. And so... Um, it's easy to like start participating in group think sometimes, but um, I think that our students should feel that they have the power to disagree and engage in that discourse. And I think that they'll find that their faculty are supportive of that. That's such a cool distinction too. There's one thing to create space for that kind of disagreement. It's another thing to actually support students when they step out of their comfort zone and, and speak up to just maybe a, a less popular perspective, let's yep. say. So that's really cool. So here's another question. It's about the big B and you've, you've mentioned belonging a lot during this presentation. Um, and, and so this parent's wondering, you know, with some efforts, you know, being focused on bringing belonging into the, into the forefront and core focus, um, you know, is, is it worthy to the point of making it DEI B? <laughs> You're actually even putting that on. Um, to me, belonging is feelings part of it, which is so very important, is Willamette considering expanding DEI into DEIB. And I mean, I know that inclusion is at least part of the equation, but I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? No, I mean, uh, this parent is wise, number one. Um, and uh, it's it's funny because when we started, when I started last, what was it, June of 2022, um, and I started thinking through kind of what this role was going to be, and I started talking to folks, and we started thinking about, you know, how we might want to define the the, the words diversity, equity, inclusion. Uh, there's three other terms that came up: uh, access, DEIA, justice, DEIJ, and belonging, DEIB. Hey. Uh, when we initially created the title for my um, very long title already. And I'd even touch on the community engagement stuff that I do. Like, um, but like, you know, um, yeah, sorry, DEIA is access. Yeah, maybe I missed that one. But thinking through like, 
what did I want my title to be? And it started off with, I think, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Um, and we're wow. like, that's a little long. It's a little long. And it my, my title's still a little long. But um, all that to say is I see access as um, an equity piece. I see belonging as an inclusion piece. Um, I see justice associated with all three. And so um, we could add a number of words to the end of that. Um, it makes it longer. Doesn't mean that the words aren't uh, integrated into all those things that we think about. Um, but but I will say that I think belonging is a really important one to to take out because it does speak to the actual lived experience. Like when we're talking about these initiatives, belonging is kind of that feeling that that parent's mentioning. And so um, we talk a lot about how to create a stronger sense of belonging. Again, not just for our students, but for our, for our, for our staff and faculty as well. Right on. And while we're talking about kind of what's included in uh, under the umbrella, you know, that you're kind of holding there, um, does neuro is neurodiversity included kind of under the DEI umbrella? I know we have a whole other office on campus. Do you interact with with that? Yeah, so that would I mean, I'm going to say two things. Number one, that this would traditionally fall under right our accessible education services or AES um, that, that deals with disability services. But but when we think about neurodiversity, just like we think about disability, particularly in the classroom or in any kind of whether that's housing, whether that's um, student account, like who's in whoever's interacting with these students, um, we understand better that the, the best practice is when it comes to neurodivergent students. And so I can tell you that last year in particular, um, as we continue to see a, a rise in neurodiverse students attending college. Um, our faculty are hyper aware of that as well. Um, we, I was, I sat in many a conversation, faculty meeting, about looking for resources, um, support uh, for how to make sure that those students that are neurodivergent are accessing and participating in the class, in the workload, um, so that they can be successful. Uh, so my office might not specifically tackle this piece. Um, but I can tell you again, it's similar to kind of DEI that I was talking. It's a collective responsibility um, that that we're thinking through from an institutional standpoint. Student affairs is thinking about this constantly, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to um, behavioral concerns, right? Whether it's in the classroom, outside the classroom, like when we're dealing with behavioral concerns that are with students that are neurodivergent, it's going to show up differently, and the, those those triggers are going to show up differently. And it's not enough just to say again. Um, one size fits all when it comes to certain disciplinary things that might need to happen. Sometimes it's a conversation or sometimes it's actually understanding that this is happening because there is a support system that's not being offered that should be offered. And so um, thinking about all those, and you know, we can talk about academics and, and how it impacts learning as well and, and making sure that the accommodations or, or different kind of teaching strategies and facilitation strategies are happening in the classroom. Um, you know, for some of our neurodivergent students, they don't, they don't feel comfortable participating in class or, or they, they need to think about their response. So it could be something as simple as a faculty member providing questions to that student ahead of time. Here are our mm -hmm. discussion questions. So you can think about what you might want to say already. Um, it, there's certain best practices that I know, even as a, as a middle school teacher, when it comes to how you encourage that in a classroom with a, with a student that has a, as an IEP or that might have some neurodivergent needs. Um, there's some best practices that you you use to create that inclusive classroom environment so that they're going to feel comfortable and confident participating. Um, so again, I think there's certainly a collective responsibility, even if it's you know often um, seen as an accessible education service. Uh, but but even though they're often making certain determinations in terms of accommodations, faculty are making in the moment classroom distinctions all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and our student affairs who are uh, professional staff that are that are supporting those students are also um, thinking about how can I individually, how can I support this individual student given their needs? Um, yeah, so that, that's a, a conversation that we are absolutely consistently having and will con continue to have. Great. I mean, I think that's an area where I see so many places. You much mentioned most of the places you know that come to mind that that really do lean in and support of neuro neurodivergent students. Um, Bishop Wellness is another area, and then uh, I believe there's also a, a neurodivergent student club. There is. Yep. Mm -hmm. So um, that that is 
yeah, that's that's great. And there work. was a there was a panel I want to say last year, maybe the year before. It might have been last year um, in the fall, I, I believe, or maybe the year before even um, on this topic as well, where it was students on a panel and faculty in the audience and talking about you know things that they could use for support or things that they would like to have offered, and and so. Um, again, I think that student advocacy piece is so important, right? Um, and thinking yeah. about that. And and parents are often as, as much as parents can be, I know also um, advocating for their students in certain ways as well, whether that's through email or, or different kinds of outreach. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, there's certainly continued conversations that go even beyond just like, I read this thing and now I think I know about it, which is great, but also like I've talked to this student and the student says that they need this. I love the school. I love the school. Amelia, we're pretty much out of time. Are there uh, any closing thoughts you want to offer before we before we wrap up this evening? No, I mean, you know, for I guess uh, you asked the question about kind of how to get involved and things like that as well. Um, you know, there's a website that I've worked really hard at creating. Um, and so hopefully it can help answer some of your questions. Um, it's still in development. It's going to be hopefully a one-stop shop at some point for a lot of these different areas. It's also got a resource tab on that website uh, with, again, different departments that are kind of engaged in diversity, equity, inclusion work. If you do take a look at the annual report, you'll see a little note from me that just says that like, this is no by no means an exhaustive list of like all the different things that are happening on campus. Like there's really incredible work that it's not going to be in that annual report from my office. Um, but I had to like limit it at some point. So it really became more about like what specific things have I or this office or the DEI committee been engaged in? Um, so you're not going to see a ton of things like student affairs related as an example. Doesn't mean there's not good work happening there. Um, and I think as questions come up, uh, you know, reach out. Like I have no problem meeting with with parents. I actually love meeting with parents. I think something again that Lamit does really, really well um, is this parent piece and trying to engage them. I mean, my mom and grandma used to come to every parents weekend thing, and my grandma still tells me to say hi to the different professors that uh, she sat in class with, and I get to tell those professors, "Do you remember my?" So like these opportunities are really incredible, and so if I can. Um, answer questions or, or, or chat with you about things that, you, that you're thinking about, like, please feel free to, to reach out. Awesome. Well, Emilio, thank you very much for sharing all this with us this evening. And uh, it's really fantastic to learn more about your work and that of our colleagues um, this evening. So hopefully our audience found this valuable and we also hope you'll join us for the next parent forums scheduled for January 24th. That one will, will be an update from athletics. Um, and our February forum focusing on graduate education across Willamette. But again, thank you, Emilio. And then also thanks to our audience members for joining us this evening. And please take care, everyone. Yeah, thanks.